So kia ora. thank you for joining us today for what I'm hoping you'll find a series of informative presentations. First off, who is WSP? We're a multidisciplinary architecture and engineering firm with over 65,000 staff globally and more than 2,000 staff across New Zealand. We've been around for over 150 years and suffice to say, if you're able to build it, then we will have experts somewhere within our group in the said field. And today, you have several of us here today to present to you. But to kick things off, I'm going to like to start the presentation with a karakia. Kia horo ti marino, kia whakapapa honamu ti moana, kei huarahi, mā tautu e te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai, Tato ia tato katoa, huia takie. May peace be spread wide, may the sea be like green stone, a pathway for all of us to stay. Let us show respect for each other, for one another, bind us all together. You have three presenters today. First up is myself. Well, I'm actually a scary version of myself on the screen right now. Um, I am the head of digital at WSP in New Zealand. Within the remit of my role, I have teams that are focused inwardly to the business, digitizing our workflows for all of our service lines. And I have another team that provides direct to client external consulting. Next on the screen is Ryan, who is a national spatial engineering manager in New Zealand, who leads our visualization, location and challenges and survey teams. And finally, Michael Boyd, who has a similar role to mine, but is based out of London, supporting our UK businesses. How this is going to run today, after I've completed my introductions, I'm going to hand over to Ryan, who will be presenting the New South Wales Special Twin for about 20 minutes. We'll then jump over to Michael's presentation, whom unfortunately is unable to join us live today, but we'll be playing a pre-recorded segment and we can reach out to Michael if there's any specific questions that we need to circle back to. I will then complete the final presentation on Hawke's Bay Arts and Event Centre um, before we jump into probably around five minutes or so of Q&A. And on that, if you have any questions during the presentations, please type them into the chat and we'll address those at the end. As a bit of a segue before we get started, I wanted to explain a few terms that will be used throughout this presentation. First off is DE or digital engineering. We define this as a collaborative way of working using digital processes that generate data sets and collateral. This recently released um, ISO standard is also a very good way of explaining it. It's often the combination of project management, asset management and data management that process is digital engineering. What is often um, created from this or throughout that process is BIM, or building information modeling, which is an object-based digital representation of a facility or asset, often with embedded data. Then we work on to as-built models, which as you can tell by the title, it reflects what was actually built, i.e. as-built. Often you have design BIMs or construction BIMs or various BIMs at various stages of the project that do often change or the design, um, what happens during construction often varies to what was designed or even the construction BIM. An as-built model is when they've gone back and site verified that was actually what was installed. And finally, digital twins. Digital twins are when you have synchronization between the virtual and the real world. And the virtual worlds are being used to help in, help inform decisions in the physical world. A stylized representation is kind of like this. So you have your physical asset and you have data streams coming from the real world from various different sources into the digital representation or the digital twin of the physical world. We then have various dashboards of various ways to engage with the digital twins. They're used for scenario planning, feedback, optimization, different ways you can manipulate the physical asset or inform the physical asset or test things with the physical asset, but in the virtual world. 
that is when you have a twin, is when you have that data connection. But dive into a little bit more detail. You know, you'll see a bit more of this in the JJ Mac and Hawke's Bay examples later in this presentation. Those digital twins centers around asset IDs and global unique identifiers within the BIM for data validation. And those connections are connected to multiple data sets in what's called a Goleman data environment. They then present this curated data in a user application or interface that the end consumer can engage with. In the toy toy example, this end state that we're talking about for the dashboard is based, based around the ArcGIS platform. It's worth noting that with digital twins, you need an environment that has the ability to read and write and interrogate multiple data sources into and from often model and based environments. You also need to consider universal access and openness, the cost of training staff, the platforms and hardware they're going to use, and all of this balance of cybersecurity. And finally, you need to consider that digital twins should last for decades, centuries even. Hence, your digital frameworks or data frameworks that you use, you also need to consider new sources of data and technologies as they emerge in formats that can be accessed for decades. They're not tied to a particular vendor or version of the software. And the ending slide, which we'll be doing today, is I'll show you a new release of something that's just come out to the market. And with that, I'd like to hand you over to Ryan for the first presentation. Over to you, Ryan. You're muted, mate. That old chestnut. <laughs> thanks a lot. Hey, thanks, Dan. Um, and I think a good place for us to start after that segue is the New South Wales Digital Twin, because it has a strong focus on our data space and getting that data space right and uh, showcases the importance of that and the value of doing that. So the New South Wales Digital Twin uh, is a digital representation of the entire physical environment of the state of New South Wales, Australia. A pretty ambitious goal um, to provide accurate and up-to-date and easily accessible information about the built and natural environment in the entire region. Off to the next slide, Dan. The statewide uh, spatial digital twins for New South Wales enhances the government's planning and management processes. Uh, it achieves this through the standardized breakdown and delivery of spatial data specifically. It provides quicker and better access to um, um, data in emergency situations, and it enables automation and advanced workflows such as Internet of Thing management and machine learning. The digital twin itself is primarily used by government agencies, urban planners, infrastructure developers um, to support decision making and improve urban planning and to foster innovation. But as you'll see, those uh, there's more and more value that's starting to come out of the digital twin as it's uh, just continues to grow and and um, provide more value to more and more users for more and more use cases. Some of what we're seeing the twin being used for now is it is helping to identify most suitable locations within the region to um, uh, provide new infrastructure. Um, it can assess the impact of those projects to the existing infrastructure, and it can optimize the design of those new developments by understanding what is around those developments as they're in the design phase. In terms of disaster scenarios, by simulating them, the digital twin can aid in the planning for emergencies, uh, and in identifying vulnerable areas in the state and optimizing the state's response to those uh, specific scenarios. The platform allows for better understanding and monitoring of the environment and supports sustainable development and conser conservation efforts. We're seeing the digital twin being used to engage the public in the planning process uh, to help build a consensus and promote, and promote transparency. Uh, you can imagine that engaging in this way, which is so inherently visual, um, would lend itself very strongly to be able to get a message across. And we're seeing that happen with the New South Wales Digital Twin. So these are just a few of these use cases, um, and they're growing and growing every day. As uh, that, the, So the value of this, the Digital Twin, the New South Wales Spatial Digital Twin, is continually growing um, just in its continued existence. 
So you can think that a platform to achieve all this would take a lot of data. And you're probably, and you're right in thinking that. Uh, it actually requires an almost an unimaginable amount of data to be able to do this. Uh, we're talking terabytes of feature data and 3D models, and literally petabytes of imagery. And not only does it take that to stand up a digital twin like this, this information needs to grow steadily so that the digital twin itself remains relevant. Um, it's important to note that uh, on the global scale, uh, New South Wales and New Zealand are relatively the same size in terms of population and um, and physical space. So we can take this as an example of what it would take to be able to deliver something similar for a national style twin for New Zealand. So this sheer amount of data poses a significant challenge. But fortunately, there are tools to help manage this. And the platform that was put in place to manage this for the New South Wales digital twin um, is what stands it apart from other digital twins because it was unique and groundbreaking in what has been placed together and has really enabled a lot of additional value that some other bespoke digital twins haven't been able to provide. Next slide, please, Dan. So when we understand that getting the data in the hands of the right people quickly and that no single workflow or combination of workflows would understand uh, would satisfy all of the users' needs, um, government at New South Wales team steered away from the, the shiny out of the box digital twin and asked WSP to focus on standardizing the way that their data gets into the platform, their data ingestion, and also the way the data gets out of the platform, the data delivery. This will ensure that the data remains interoperable because we have a common state of what we understand it to go in as well as what we understand it to go out, which allows the twin to be in a matter of fact, uh, software agnostic. You see, by focusing on this data instead of the, the end point of what showcases the information, we can start leveraging the best tool for what we want to be able to use the twin for. So in, uh, for example, in the case of advanced editing and analytics, um, tools like ArcGIS Esri, QGIS, Global Mapper, your standard GIS platforms can just tap into the APIs and start utilizing the data in a standard and understood form. We have common viewers that we can leverage. We don't have to use just one. Um, Terraria and uh, Data61 is one of those that are uh, uh, an open source tool that is highly leveraged around in the digital twin space and is being used for this specific twin as well. But as well as tools like uh, Bentley iTwin and more bespoke tools like Giraffe can tag into the data as well. If we want to explore the data in more of a data analytic way, we can do that as well um, by connecting into that standardized data by using tools like Tableau and Power BI. Um, and we can really delve into that bottom level of the information uh, through uh, tools like Oracle. If we want to go the other way and start exploring the information in really rich visualizations, because we have that standard data set that we can leverage, we can start bringing that information directly into Unreal. Uh, the visualization engines such as Unreal and Unity and have that game engine ultra realistic feel. Uh, on top of this as well, um, we don't know what the future holds. So as long as we have those APIs and that method of connecting into the data um, shored up and standardized, we can start plugging in further extensions and our own pre-built custom code, as well as leveraging tools like machine learning from Amazon or, um, or AI tools to be able to work on the data itself and drive uh, information from it. So the digital twin that we've put together improves access to the data and focuses on its integration and interoperability to improve collaboration, management of resources, data quality and currency, and in turn makes it a much more powerful decision-making tool. Just a little bit more um, detail around what was specifically put together to enable this, because while we wanted the data to be able to be standardized, uh, we knew that that was our vision for the New South Wales Digital Twin. Um, we needed to make sure we were using some very strong platforms to be able to manage that data. What we realized very quickly in uh, developing the spatial, the spatial twin was that the questions asked of our data were almost always a location one. Show me the most up-to-date imagery in this area. 
What are the modes of travel to get uh, I can take to get from point A to B? Where are the exposed assets in my network and so on? These were all spatial questions. So with this starting understanding, we took a, a spatial approach to standardization of the data. Um, we knew that uh, FME was a very strong manipulation engine to manage data and has a lot of spatial componentry within it to be able to um, manipulate and standardize. So we leveraged that as a tool to be able to work with some customization code that uh, WSP has put together to store data from multiple different sources uh, and ingest it in a standardized way. These workflows not only will ensure the data remains standardized, but we're actually giving feedback to the data admins who are pushing data into the platform and advising them in what areas that their data needs to be corrected to be able to be ingested into the digital twin. Once we had that standardization in place, we had to make sure that we had a very strong platform to store a heck of a lot of data. And this is where the coordinates platform that we leverage for New South Wales comes into play. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that entails in the next slide. So through that platform with coordinates, uh, just before you go to that slide, Dan, through that platform with coordinates, we were able to push the data into some common already BAU spaces that the, the council, uh, sorry, the government was already using. And that is specifically using Esri for their geospatial analysis. And a tool that was already developed and set up was that um, Terraria engine and that visualization engine through uh, Data61 um, and Cesium to be able to present that information in a graphical way. So go ahead and next slide, Dan. So if you're not familiar with uh, the coordinates, you will likely be familiar here in New Zealand with the Lens Data Service. Um, this is the uh, definitive place for us to grab spatial information as geographers or as anyone who wants to understand a little bit more about the information, uh, the digital data that represents the space of New Zealand. This uh, data service is managed by LINS, but the underlying platform that manages and serves this data is the coordinates platform. Uh, inspired by uh, GIS and inspired by the need to be able to present and, and deliver GIS information in a standardized and a convenient way, the coordinates platform provides that ability not only to ingest the data, but to ensure that the data is in a, plat in a, in a state that can be highly utilized and highly um, accessible to all of its users. Um, we, we were able to use the use case of LINS to be able to prove to New South Wales that a uh, a data set of this size can be managed and utilized um, to be able to be presented in uh, in for the New South Wales government. This platform itself helped us get the important data into the hands of the millions of planners and analysts and decision makers in New Zealand for over a decade. And that was understood that we'd be able to leverage this in the same manner for New South Wales. The coordinates platform not only stores the data, but allows um, us to be able to visualize the changes to the data and uh, interrogate where the data has changed over time, which gives us a whole new dimension to our ability to be able to interrogate and ask questions from the twin. It also provides the ability to review that history and see who had made those changes so that we can um, go back in time and actually go right from the sources, who has made those changes to our spatial data sets to make sure that we can are advising our planners in the best way possible to the changes that are happening in the real world. Next slide, please. This was a really big undertaking for us to be able to do this. Um, we needed to make sure that we had a process in place to be able to deliver the many different features that were proposed um, and be able to still maintain a common vision and platform into what we were delivering. So WSP specifically employed the agile delivery process to be able to ensure that we were getting that connectivity and that message across while still mm -hmm. staying on target with the goals for New South Wales government. And this is truly the standard way that WSP is now delivering their digital twin projects. It provides us continuous integration with the, our clients. So New South, New South Wales were part of the delivery process and they saw that what was coming out um, from our developers and from our workers to what was being delivered and rolled out. 
into that continuous delivery. So not only was uh, were they engaged, but they were actually receiving information as they were and, and util utilizing that twin before we had even released it. And that really advised and helped push us forward on ensuring that we were staying on track, but also caught us in places where we were able to revise our plan and ensure that we were uh, heading much more on target. There's lots of tools that help manage the agile process in this in this space. For this specific instance, we use JIRA and Confluence to be able to manage the agile process. But there's a lot of free tools out there such as um, ClickUp and um, even tools such as Trello that can help manage this style of, of engagement with the client. The one team and one integrated and connected space allowed us to be um, very connected to the client and we and they felt as ingest ad invested into the delivery of this as we did. Um, so it was, it was extremely important to uh, to ensure that we had that uh, that buy in throughout the entire team throughout the entire length of that project. And of course, we have the change management built into the process so we can ensure that we are um, delivering and making adjustments as needed as we go. But what was best about this entire process is that it set itself up to a BAU process that would allow the twin to continue to innovate and adapt as new technologies got introduced, as we identified new opportunities for the twin. We are really just extending the project life to, um, to, to continue that process of continuous delivery and continuous investment, making the twin more and more valuable as time goes on. Next slide, please. OK, we uh, at WSP have been through a number of these things now, so we feel like we've got an idea on some of the things that kind of creep up that we 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 want to make sure we avoid that. We want to impart this knowledge on you today. Um, we've taken the time to join us here. Uh, the first that I'll mention is the shiny object syndrome. This specific uh, specifically means that we can get really tied up on the fact that there are really cool visualizations that can come out of these projects. Um, we can get invested into the detail at the ground level. Um, and even things like having the dashboards present the right colors and, and fancy visualizations, that kind of thing um, can be very important depending on what your vision is for your specific twin. But in most cases, uh, it can often detract from what's that, uh, the, what you truly want to be able to do with the twin. So you have to be very careful of this. It can also send you down the right wrong path of what tools you want to focus on to deliver. So I would say take a take a trip uh, a check on this and make sure that you're not going down a path to add features and add shiny objects just for the sake of it and just for the sake of making your twin appear visually stunning. Um, another common pitfall is having blurry vision, and what I mean by this is not having a a purpose identified that is you know, universally understood. Um, a few stakeholders might have uh, what they see as that purpose is, and they might have a defined vision that is written down, but it could be too vague and it's not properly understood across all the stakeholders, or it could be just um, not fully understood by all of the stakeholders. So you need to uh, ensure that that vision not only is, is sound, but it also is properly communicated. And we need to make sure when there's a lot of moving parts in a project like this, that we're continually checking of what we're doing against our vision all the way to the end of the project. Um, because you can easily lose track on going down one path or the other. We need to continue asking ourselves, are we doing this and how does this align with our vision that we set at the beginning? Um, if we find that it's going too far a path, we have to pull that back a little bit. Um, having blurry vision is, a, is an easy way to lose track in a project. Going the other way, uh, away from the shiny object syndrome and trying to focus a little bit too much on the data and saying, let's just gather all of the data first and then we'll figure it out later, can also be a bit of a pitfall. Um, there is so much data within these projects that taking this style of an approach can be very detrimental to your digital twin. You have to be focusing on what that key data sets is that align with your vision to make sure that that data is going to be of high value. Um, the data itself will always grow. You're never gonna gather and collect it all. So make sure that those key data sets that you really need to be able to deliver your vision are captured up front, and you can work on those specific data sets to start growing out. You'll find that you may 
uh, have additional data sets you need to bring in later, that's okay. But don't worry about getting all the data up front because you'll never get it all. This is kind of aligned with the vision, but having your key stakeholders not engaged um, is, is a common um, uh, fall towards a project and things that, that make digital twins hard to deliver. Um, stakeholders are is a little bit of a vague term, but stakeholders themselves can be the public. It can be um, the, the planners who will be utilizing it. Uh, it could potentially be your emergency services. Um, and of course, those at the council or those in the entity that are going to receive the end digital twin and use it as their day to day process. Uh, it's incredibly important that you they stay engaged and they stay up to date throughout the, the delivery of the process, uh, because if they just get dropped a twin at the very end, they're probably not going to feel as connected to it. They're not going to be as uh, fluid in navigating and utilizing it. And there'll be a lot of uh, information to take in to be able to make sure that information or to be able to make sure that they can use it. So what you'll see uh, very quickly, if you haven't identified your stakeholders um, well throughout the end of the, throughout the project, is that you've got almost a full other project to do some upskilling and some training on the digital twin to, for, to allow people to get the use out of it. So. There's much more to this that uh, much more complexity that goes around to this, but these are some of the four key things that we've identified that we actively attempt to avoid and can set yourself your digital your own digital twin up for success. That's a little bit of an example of what we did at New South Wales and some of the learnings we did from it. I'll hand you back to Dan now, who will talk you through a few other examples, and uh, and we'll go from there. Thanks. Thank you, much, Ryan. It's um. That scale is, you know, an interesting thing to quantify, right? So this digital twin or spatial twin that your team have created for the whole of New South Wales is essentially the, you know, the population of New Zealand. So the technology is not the limit, you know, it's actually the people and process that is. So with that, I'd like to hand over to my next presenter, who's going to be our virtual Michael Boyd from the UK. I'm about to push play. So if Brian or someone else can put a thumbs up to make sure the audio is coming through okay. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Michael Boyd. Oops, that all just not. I can't push the. I'm head of digital for property and buildings in the UK. Uh, I also look after our digital services offering, which um, offers clients information management, uh, BIM management, and digital advisory, and also digital twin readiness on their projects. Uh, next slide, please. So what I want to do is take you through a case study of a project we've recently handed over for our client Helico, and that's the recently renamed JJ Mack building in Farringdon in London, which is very close to our 70 Chancery Lane office, which I'm in just now. Uh, when we first met with Helico, um, they let us know of an aspiration that they had. They wanted to be the smartest office in London. Um, there's a, a very high concentration of, uh, sort of tech firms in the Farringdon area, and they wanted to target these firms as potential clients. And what they wanted to do was uh, combine all the digital design information that was created through the delivery and the construction phase, and all the data they were capturing from the physical asset in, by way of sensors, and pull it into a digital twin to in, both improve the sort of building operations and efficiency, but also um, the user experience. Next slide, please. So our role in the project initially was to be the, the client side information management and BIM consultant. Um, like I said, it was a, initially a client side role that was then uh, novated to the contractor. And that allowed us to um, work with the client to define their goals and objectives and define all of the information management requirements and standard for all of the delivery teams uh, based on the international, international standard ISO 19650. So we had a very active role on this project. This was uh, heavily involved in sort of data validation and, and making sure there was a digital legacy of all the data that was created in the delivery phase. And it also involved coordination, spatial coordination of all the design team's information and the contractor supply chain packages. Next slide. So this is just an example of some of the element elements of our role in uh, managing the digital delivery process from very basic sort of digital engineering and coordination tasks to linking the construction program uh, with the 3D BIM data for a very detailed sort of 4D programming and logistics planning. 
Um, we also manage the, the field verification of data using um, augmented reality and, and weekly 360 degree panoramic um, routes that were taken through the building. Um, a significant amount of our time was, as I've said already, data validation, um, managing or making sure all the data was complete and compliant with the standards that we had defined earlier. Um, and all of this was done to, to de-risk the project and provide reliability on that data that was produced during delivery. Next slide, please. So the image on the top right gives uh, an indication of, uh, or the top left, sorry, gives an indication of the level of detail that we took all the construction packages to. Um, modeling right down to the shear studs and the slabs uh, with about 20 separate models combined into the master federated model. Um, the visualization on the installation sequencing, uh, we, we used various tools from that, from, from Synchro working with the contractor to using Unreal to, uh, to display here the sort of uh, the installation of the, the MEP packages and also the modular riser installation coming into the building. And I've said already the, the sort of 360 panel walkthrough of each floors. And we decided to do this during the sort of COVID-19 pandemic to allow the client access to their building to see uh, progress without them having to turn up to site. So they could actually view the 3D model on one side and walk through the building to see what should be there against what was actually installed. Next slide, please. So to discuss the sort of data requirements, um, we started out on this project with a, a very basic sort of COBE data schema for deliverable for mostly the MEP elements. Um, and then we started interfacing with the master uh, systems integrator, a, a company called Smart Spaces. Um, and then we captured their specific attributes that they required for the eventual digital twin. And we only needed about 19 or 20 pieces of data for them. So we created a, a shared parameter file in Revit and shared that amongst all the disciplines to push the data fields into their models to allow consistency across the project and make it easier for us when we were validating that data. So a lesson learned for us that um, although we started out with hundreds of lines of COBE data, um, we only needed 19 lines of very, very specific um, attributes for to be pulled into the digital twin. Next slide, please. So this is an overall simplified process for delivery of the twin um, and the part that we played. Um, a key part of this role is meeting with the various vendors that are coming in um, from the contractor to make sure that what we're providing is a uh, for the active data or the smart building design is both open protocol and interoperable, interoperable as much as possible with as little API links as possible. Um, and the goal was to deliver this digital twin uh, within 12 weeks prior to practical completion. I don't think we were that close. I think we were roughly about four weeks before, um, but it's all up and running now. Next slide, please. And this is just some examples of the digital twin in action. And um, this is the building manager view, um, and it gives access to various controls for sort of lighting and, and temperature control, and allows the building manager to gain insight from real-time analytics with regard to energy consumption and things like that. And it's also linked all the maintainable elements to the BMS for a visualization of future maintenance requirements. Um, in the bottom right there, you can see there's also some uh, sort of elevator or lift control. And as a lesson learned for us, that's that's definitely something um, that just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. Um, our client wanted to give access to all our building users to call a lift from their mobile phone. And that sounds like a great idea until you imagine 200 people or 150 people on a floor plate all calling them a, a lift while they're sitting at their desk and uh, the disruption that that might cause. So we decided to limit the control of that to uh, the reception staff. Next slide, please. So as well as the, the digital twin from a building manager view, the client um, Helico, they wanted to foster a, a sort of community and enhance the, the sort of workplace well-being. Um, I, as I mentioned, it was a very tech savvy place in, in London and they've implemented a, a building user app to improve all user experiences of the facility. 
and that allows access control, booking a desk, room controls like temperature and lighting, and various uh, different concierge events. And this is a trend we're seeing across most of the commercial office developments in London, um, where they are uh, employing um, smart developers to de de develop very bespoke apps for their buildings. Next slide, please. So WSP um, led the proposal for the team, um, for the contractor, the delivery team and the client, and uh, we won the Digital Construction Award in 2021. And uh, the judges commented uh, that one of the highlights of that submission was the integration between uh, the BIM delivery, um, the smart design and an engaged client on, that, on this particular submission. Next slide. So if I could leave you with some, some lessons learned from, from this project, and, and there was many, um, it's very important that we bring in the right people as early as possible. Um, both to understand their needs, but also to map out the dependencies of, of who needs data and when. Um, when it comes to the data you're asking for, you know, are we going with a, a standard data set or a bespoke? Um, I don't think there's a right answer for that, but we did waste a lot of time um, on this project capturing uh, data that, was not, that did not end up being used on this project. Um, so understanding what data is needed um, and when that data is required is, is absolutely key. And following on for that, um, digital twins at this point in time is very much a, a sort of data integration task and understanding the data schemas, the naming conventions is extremely important if you don't want to waste time when it comes to validating and integrating that data later. And if I just take you back to that lift example, um, if you're not adding value, don't add complexity. There was no need for us to develop access to allow everyone to control the lift on the mobile phone. Um, the real value from that was allowing specific people access. So if you're not adding value, don't add complexity. And I'll, what I'll leave you with is um, before selecting any technology, it's important that you understand the value proposition. So understand the vision, develop any strategic outcomes and understand the performance uh, ambitions you're trying to achieve before you start looking at technology. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Virtual Marvel. Hello, everyone. Um, yep. I'm going to start that one again. So the final presentation we're going to for the rest of um, the session this afternoon, actually, um, we're going back over to New Zealand, and this time we're going over to Hastings to talk about the historically listed Opera House, aka Toy Toy. And you can see how ornate the interior of that space is from that image in the background now. Our client for this project Hastings District Council wanted to use this facility as a proof of concept to assess how the digitization of existing assets could improve the use of the facility, simplify the decision making process for long term asset management, create and make it more efficient use of the asset, and create a digital record for long term resiliency. This asset was chosen specifically because it is a relatively hard geometry to digitize. It is historically listed and it's hence had quite a lot of significance for the council. So how did we start that process? Um, how did we capture that and how did we go through this process of creating a digital record? So you can see on screen a high level um, summary of what we did. So we went to a BIM model conversion. So how we did that, and you'll see in the next video I'll play, is that we use various scanning techniques to create a digital point cloud of the facility. We then use full-blown BIM authoring application or BIM authoring software to create a full-blown as-built BIM model of the facility. All of those items of importance within that BIM model had asset IDs and registers who I mentioned in the first part of my presentation. And that was connected to the council's live SPM asset data um, system. So the council's asset data system was connected to the BIM via those unique identifiers. We then ported the two across to ArcGIS and we created these online portals to be able to visualize and engage with the BIM model um, and interrogate the data. We created a bunch of different dashboards that were bespoke to the client to really democratize the access to that information and make it a lot clearer and also not require access or uh, licensing of high-end software 
as it is an ArcGIS portal, it is online and visible to any platform or any device, I should say. So what we're looking at here is a resulting BIM model. So that is the full blown building information model. And you'll see these various scanning devices zooming in and out of this video. It is relatively challenging to retrospectively scan something because if you don't know, with laser scanning drones and the various other capture techniques that were used, it's line of sight. So you can't see behind walls and you can't see behind ceilings. The way that we got the structure is literally climbing up into ceiling spaces um, and putting in scanning devices to capture this process. And this is a um, valid or useful return on investment because of the complexity and value of this asset. This is what the GIS portal looks like. So before, if you notice carefully, this looks a little bit simpler. So this is where we went from the geometry, the real world stuff. We created a full blown BIM model from that. And then we simplified that geometry to be represented in the ArcGIS format. But it's not just a visualization. If you clicked on any of these items in that space, they're actual three dimensional objects with associated IDs and associated data. So what benefits are we pursuing in regards to efficiency and management of operations and maintenance? As you can see here on the screen, this is one of those ArcGIS dashboards. We are able to easily visualize and optimize building works to extract more value from the assets. We're allowing targeted extension of renewals and upgrades and related to the known usage. By very simple sliders, we can see the maintenance costs by room for the selected year. Room colors change in the floor pan based on the corrected or the selected year. And we can interrogate these rooms to break down the OPEX or CAPEX or even the type of assets. So whenever you use that, you don't like to use buzzwords, but that democratizing of access, I think is actually a good way of explaining it. Instead of having GIS professionals and complicated databases, we're able to show them in a visual user interface that will work for them. And as I'll show you in some other examples we're using in the subsequent slides, is that we can customize this interface intimately, or infinitely, I should say. So what we're looking at here is the public, sorry, the private interface. This is the council asset management team, where they can see all sorts of financial data, operational maintenance data, um, ONM manuals and the like. But then we can use that same portal and platform via security logins to use that for a public interface. And this is what I mean by that. So that same data set, the same dashboard, but this time from a public view. So we're able to connect that space to show, OK, well, here's the events that are coming up, Mr. and Mrs. Joe Public. Um, what would you like to book? When is that available? How many seats are available? Show me a preview of that, um, that particular event. Which space is it in? How do I get to that? You can even go down to uh, what does it look like from my particular seat that I am booking? All within this one interface. So you can see what's coming, you can see your seat, you can see the location, you can see the preview, and you can go and book the tickets. Also, if it's tied to the scenario planning, we're able to research, um, rehearse um, various um, maintenance events. So say we had to do some large scale um, equipment that we need to get in and out of the facility or turn off some particular HVAC. Having these connected environments, you can schedule that as optimally as possible. Moving on to environmental sensors, like Michael's example, incorporating IoT devices in the way of environmental sensors. And IoT, if you don't know, just means Internet of Things. The thing is on the Internet. Uh, we're able to automate environmental controls based on occupancy and dashboards. We could quantify how the spaces are performing so that adjustments can be made. Another example that we're looking at currently, or been talking about currently, is installing water sensors in a known problem in that facility with internal guttering. So if we had some sensors in there and we're connecting that to our MET service reports, then the owners and operators can have a preactive or proactive response. So they know a particular event is coming, um, then they know that the weaknesses of the facility and they can prepare accordingly. Elaborate on that bit further, we're now even able to simplify the use of facility by connecting multiple data sources relevant to the access 
into the use of the building and surrounding area. You'll see some more examples of this at the end of the presentation. But I'm a visitor to Napier or Hastings. Show me the parks and reserves. Show me the car parks. Show me the bus routes. Show me the bus stops. Show me other points of interest around that area. This can be a one stop portal for that communication of facilities and environments and um, experiences, I guess, um, to the user across the entire area. And we're having this conversation with the council at the moment, as now we've done, I think we've done about three assets from now, um, both buildings beside it and another one, um, is that how do we then scale it up to you know, hundreds of assets across the entire portfolio? And again, this is the building information model, but simplified in ArcGIS format, and it's probably hard to see on the screen, but that was a website. One point I want to cover specifically in this part of the presentation is insurance that laser scans and digital twins can provide. What you're looking at there is actually a laser scan. It's a colorized point cloud, and that's the resulting BIM model converted into GIS. So that one there, that's not a video. Those are points that you can click on and interrogate throughout the entire space. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but you know, if the Notre Dame Cathedral fire, for example, um, fortunately prior to the fire, in 2010, the entire structure was captured by laser scans, which, you, as you can imagine, has helped the restoration team immeasurably. Same here applies to Toy Toy. You imagine how hard it was to do those ornate mouldings. Didn't make any sense to go and model that to that level of fidelity in a three dimensional model. It added no value, just added cost. But we, since we have the point cloud scan that is very, very accurate, millimeter accurate, worst case scenario happens that this facility needs to be rebuilt. Those could be drawn upon to create three dimensional models. Uh, we're pleased to advise that we've won multiple awards for this project, um, multiple IPWA awards, and also local governance awards. But what are we doing next? These that was a pilot I showed you. We're actually working on a few more steps from here. So we're now moving on to climate change adaption and long-term planning. We've already started this phase of the project when the cyclone Gabriel hit. Looking at the screen right now, you know, it's hard to comprehend it only, um, the scale of damage in this region. No power, no comms or water for days. This is a really important stuff, right? This is the stuff that is really, really important to us in our society. And how can this technology help you or help mitigate that? This is why we're currently working with the council on how to use these aforementioned technologies to better plan for this climate change and help the council preemptively plan to increase the resiliency of many assets. And that's why the spatial digital twin is so exciting. This technology is infinitely scalable. It's not just buildings, it's not just infrastructure, it's the dirt, it's a geotech, it's the entire environment that you're involved with it. We engage with it. We have this conversation at the moment. So we talked to you before about the scan to BIM example that we did on Toy Toy. But how do you scale this up for many assets across an entire region? How do you use it for an in a um, impact assessment on a, a, a roof a building? How does we assess geotech and all that dirt that you can see that's been driven around the area? Or right down to individual asset registers for individual items. How do you scale this up and down based on the need of the client um, and also the data sets that are available? Not that I'm suggesting a digital twin of a photocopier is very useful. So what makes sense from a return of investment perspective? Do we need to scan and create the models of everything the council owns? Or will simple plans, outlines, data points on GIS maps or 3D meshes suffice? There is no doubt on the value of the digitizing assets, particularly for new builds, but what is the solution is suitable for retrospectively digitizing assets and what degree of accuracy is needed? The scan to BIM process does take time and does cost money. It has improved immeasurably over the last few years. It's a lot easier than it was to do previously, but it's probably not something that you want to do across entire cities or entire countries. It's not that point yet where that makes financial sense. 
So what we're working on at the councils or various councils we're working with is a menu of services with returns. You can get this level of fidelity for this cost and its return and scale it up and down based on the need for that particular asset. But the most important part is the connection behind that, how they're all connected and interoperable. I don't know if you've seen this yet, but fortunately we're at a technology where at a state and time for technology that there is no limit. What we're looking at on the screen now is gaming tech that can scale up to any level. As I said before, this could be a toilet block, a facility, a region or whole countries. If you have not seen it yet, um, on the left hand side of the screen um, is Google Earth has recently released photorealistic 3D meshes of the entire world using the same 3D map source as Google Earth. So you can now, and we're already starting to do this, is you can grab those data sets and engrave them into your own gaming technology and interface with them. The right hand side of that screen um, of the, is the Wellington region. And over the last couple of years, the Wellington Council spent a huge amount of time to create their own 3D models, which I have to think is very impressive. They've recently released to the market under a Creative Commons license. That is what you can see on the screen there is the geometry that's provided by the council that we've ingrained and embedded into our Unreal Gaming Engine technology. But also is really interesting now that Google has released this for the entire world. You also need to keep reminding yourself though, as Ryan was saying, and also reiterated by Michael, is all about the data. It's so much more important than the fancy 3D models. And as I said, it's about that return on investment and who is gonna drive it? How much will cost to maintain? Are there expensive software commitments? You know, that is why we actually chose ArcGIS as the end platform for Toy Toy, as that council and many councils across the country already have enterprise license agreements for that platform. So our process was not adding any cost to the annual commitments. Finally, don't underestimate the value of cloud hosted digital records of important assets. None of us know what is around the corner and having a digital record of your asset does provide a lot of peace of mind to a lot of our clients.